Ontario's Green Energy Act promised many things, but Gord Miller, the province's environmental commissioner, says the act fell short. He joins us now in studio to talk about those shortcomings and what our province can and should do to contribute to the national energy strategy. Gord Miller, it's good to have you back at TVO. It's always a pleasure to be here. Let's start by talking about the feed-in tariff. Sure. This is an awful name for what has been a very controversial program. So Absolutely. tell us what the feed-in tariff program is. Well, it all comes down to how do we pay the companies or the generators electricity. And in the past, we've used all sorts of different models, you know, to, to cost that we guarantee some of the gas plants a certain amount of money, make sure they'll, they'll bid in. A, we have a market, but they have to be guaranteed some base amount. That's why would you build a gas plant? But when it came back to to renewable energy and wind and solar primarily, some others, biogas, um, they came up with a system that's been used around the world, which is we'll guarantee a, a rate, you generate the electricity, we'll pay you a certain rate relative to what we think, you know, it's cost to have your technology because we want your technology. So you get a guaranteed rate per kilowatt hour. That's a feed-in tariff. If you produce, if you've got a solar um, generation facility, if you produce a kilowatt hour, you get paid in, in the case of solar now, it's going to be a, a, a rooftop solar, solar, very small, 55 cents a kilowatt hour. And it, and it guarantees there would be production, but you pay a, pr a premium price. Now, the government made that undertaking with solar and wind producers many years ago. Several years ago, yeah. In the summer, they made some changes. What happened this summer? Well, you know, there was a lot of talk, of, and on this show, in fact, of the, you know, the famous 80 cents per kilowatt hour, which, of course, would only apply to a very, very small, tiny slice of the power we generate. We generate 30,000 megawatts, megawatts in this province and in the first round of the feed-in tariff, which we call FIT. Uh, I think, you know, this t rooftop solar at 80 cents, there was about 120 of those meg megawatts. They so got a lot of attention, those megawatts. A lot of attention. So that when, as was always planned, they wanted to have some opening prices that were attractive because they were trying to get this started in, in this business of solar and wind and biogas and biomass uh, production and, and such things. So uh, now they've, after they've reviewed it, they've dropped the amount of prices. That's the big change. And a whole bunch of other little refinements in, in, the, in the sort of rules around it that are some of which are very significant to producers wouldn't affect the consumers very much. So now that the government of Ontario has said we're not going to pay you as much any longer right. as we were intending to pay you years ago for you to produce your solar or wind power, is it reasonable to assume that those who are in that business will still be able to create the nearly 11,000 megawatts of power that the government is expecting will come from these renewables? They seem to be still lining up. And of course, you know, a couple of factors have changed since the start of it. For instance, the price of solar panels has come way down, and that's what was expected. So the, the people who are in bidding on solar projects, you know, they don't have to get those, this higher rate anymore. Uh, and, in, and in the wind technology, I would, the price has come down a bit perhaps, but more importantly, the, the ability to install, the industry has developed. So now we have uh, companies that will install, produce all the component parts and that sort of thing. So uh, it, the industry has matured, so the unit installation cost is, is lower and so it's quite reasonable and they're still bidding on the contract so it looks like it's going to work. It's hard to pick up a newspaper these days particularly in the business section without reading an article about how this industry is going under in Germany, in Spain, in Italy, here. Well, you know, is that the case? No, that's the fascinating part. If you follow it as closely as I do, it's, I, I agree with you. These, I see these articles, and uh, uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, disparity. And you know, and you take Germany, all sorts of talk about uh, these in, renewable energy going under. Well, Germany has just had record levels of installation of solar power. Uh, the the solar cost of solar power on, on rooftops, for instance, I read an article today. Uh, the, in some areas of Germany, has gone to what they call grid parity, which simply means it's as cheap to get it from a rooftop as it is if you put your own panels on, as it is to buy it from the local utility. utility. So, uh, no, around the world, the, uh, there's a huge boom uh, in, in renewable energy still going on. Okay. Commissioner, I want you to look at the monitor over my shoulder there because we're going to play some tape. Guelph University's Ross McKittrick was on the program back in April discussing the Green Energy Act, and here's what he had to say about subsidies for renewable projects. Roll tape, please. If you want to say other firms are being subsidized, so we should subsidize wind and solar as well, then I would say we shouldn't be subsidizing any of them. If we went to that world, then you would see coal and natural gas competitive at wholesale electricity rates. Nobody would be building windmills and nobody would be putting in solar panels. Essentially, no subsidies, no industry. Well, does that include no subsidies for the gas plants and no subsidies for nuclear? Because, of course, there are subsidies for those now, too. And that's what's never talked about. I mean, the gas plants, uh, you know, they're not altruistic uh, organizations. They're profit centers. When you, when you build a gas plant, uh, your company for hundreds of millions of dollars, you get a guarantee. And, and you get that whether you're called upon to produce electricity or not. 
And so that, and that's of course, lately in Ontario, we've been consuming a lot less energy than we did historically, partly because of the, of, the, uh, of course, the economy downturn, but also because of some conservation measures. So gas plants get subsidized. They get guarantees. But they're for-profit businesses. They're for-profit businesses. And they're making so, a profit. And they're making a profit. How about this stuff? Which, that, solar, course, solar they're making a profit, all the commercial ones. I mean, some of them are small little mm -hmm. utilities for good for farms and those tiny ones that are good extra income. But the big ones are making money. And uh, yeah, it's, it's all for, for So I'm, if he wants it all on level playing field, let's get all the costs on the table. And so, okay, so as the environmental commissioner, your mm -hmm. job is not to worry about the health of the business. Your job no, is to worry about the health right. of the environment. That's right. You're saying these subsidies are still defensible policy. Well, the gas sub are the gas subsidies defensible? That's what I'm saying. So Everybody for, subsidizes. Everybody's for the got goose? their. That's right. Okay. Everybody's got their finger in the pot here. Got it. Let's take conservation. We've been trying in this that's province big, for 30 years to create a culture of conservation. Yeah. How are we doing? We're struggling. I mean, there are some good things, and, and uh, there's some you know initiatives that are working. Uh, you know, we have. If you look at the electricity uh, situation in Ontario, uh, there's there's two initial problems. One is we have this peaking problem, which you probably heard of. In other words, when the air conditioner is going on, on a hot day in the summer. Uh, the price of electricity, by the way, on the market goes up to 30, 40 cents, 50 cents sometimes. Hmm. Uh, and then we have another problem in the cool fall days of, that we're about approaching because we have a lot of base load. We have, when it's all working, we have 10,000 megawatts of, of uh, nuclear online and, uh, and, and you know, the big hydroelectric dams at uh, Niagara Falls and places like that that have to go. And some of the old gas contracts which get paid even when we have a surplus because hmm. so, of the guarantees. Uh, so we have, uh, we, we've gone into negative pricing in past years. That's going to stop. But negative pricing meaning we can I mean, get, we have paid people to take all the surplus take our power. We can't get the generation down low enough. Down low. Hmm. When you get around 12,000 megawatt demand, like we're, we're going to peak today at 17,000 megawatts. Well, if you get around, certainly if you get to 10,000 megawatt demand in the middle of the night, we got a surplus of power. So there's two huge opportunities for conservation. And we are doing some things in Ontario, but uh, in my opinion, not enough yet. Let's uh, discuss Ontario's role on the national energy scene because this came to a head a while back when the Premier of Ontario and the pre new Premier of Alberta kind of went at it for a little bit here. <laughs> I'm going to read you something that Roger Gibbons had to say, the President and CEO of the Canada West Foundation. Here's what he said last March. The root of this optimism, he says, lies with Premier McGuinty. Of all the provincial leaders other than the Premier of Alberta, he has provided the most far-reaching leadership on energy policy. His green vision, which resonates with many Canadians inside and outside Ontario, and his linkage of energy policy to broader national industrial policy are badly needed as part of the national conversation. Yet to this point, the government of Ontario has not been part of a growing national conversation on the need for and shape of a Canadian energy strategy. Now, through the media exchange with Premier Redford, McGuinty has signaled that he is ready to come off the bench and onto the field. This is a very important change. I want to get your view on this redford McGinty rapprochement and whether this is an important development on this file. Well, I think it's anything, discussion, you know, participation, cooperation is always a good development. Let's say. But the problem in Canada, I think, is that you know, people have to realize we, we, the provinces are quite disparate in their, in their sources of energy and their situations. Everybody, uh, Alberta burns coal to a large extent and of course we're phasing right out of coal. Alberta doesn't have the hydroelectric or, or the nuclear uh, resources that we have. So they're completely different markets and, and of course the industrialization is different, the demand is different. So you know the national energy strategy thing is, is um, a little bit misleading because you know Quebec and, and Manitoba have tons of hydroelectricity, cheap mm -hmm. hydroelectricity. Plus all for all our provinces, all our big connections on energy where we do are all not between each other, they're all with the United States mm -hmm. and the South. So um, I mean it's good for discussion, but I think the, the, there's, there's not a lot of uh, value on the sort of an energy side that we can get out of that national discussion, but there is a lot of value on the greenhouse gas side, or the car, price of carbon, that sort of thing. That's where the discussion um, can go and, and make some valuable advances for Canada. I wonder if that's a bit of a non-starter though, because you know, Premier Redford's pretty committed to developing mm -hmm. those oil sands. Obviously, well, true, but he has a, Redford's got a $15 price, bottom price on carbon. There, there's, hmm. you know, cap and trade, and it's based on uh, you know, efficiency base, but nonetheless, there's, there's a price on carbon in, in British Columbia, a price of carbon in Alberta, and somewhat of a carbon tax in Quebec. Let's talk biodiversity. Uh, last January, you delivered a report on biodiversity. You questioned whether Canada was becoming known as a country that reneges on its commitments as it relates to uh, the global environment. You were speaking in the context of biodiversity at the time, but I wonder how well you think we are fulfilling our commitments to the research and development of cleaner energy technologies. 
Oh, I think we're 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 failing. The only ones got we're got attention, of course, is carbon capture and, and storage, which is uh, well, which we had initiatives on and backed off on, and now Shell, as uh, Royal Dutch Shell, has now uh, advanced uh, another new initiative, the only one that we're doing in Canada. But that seems to be the only area we're 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 thrusting forward. I mean, we we part of this whole green energy initiative initially was we talked about going to a smart grid, which we seem to have stalled on. It's Parts are installed, but where's the storage? Where's the storage technology? Where's the innovation around that? Where's uh, some of the innovation of uh, some of the unique distributed generation, some of the efficiencies in transmission and distribution? I guess we're looking at that, but you'd hardly say we're sort of cutting edge at this point. Well, Premier Brigitte said, though, he wanted to be the leading jurisdiction in all of North America in terms of being out there for green energy. Yeah. He was in that chair not too long ago, and he said, you've got to pick a lane, and that's the lane we're picking. Right. He's had to pay a high political price for that, though. There, you know, as you pointed out earlier, there are a lot of people who've gone hard on him as a result of this. Do you think they're kind of losing their edge on this now? Well, they seem to be. Because there's, there's a number of topics where they've seemed to have cooled and, and lost their enthusiasm, and that's uh, I think that's dangerous. When you go in the uh, in the fast lane, you got to keep going the speed limit or better, you know. And uh, and so uh, there's no question. Uh, I'd like to see some more developments. We haven't got seen the thrust to, to the same extent. Of course, it's minority government, and we're into, um, I guess there's sort of certain things over there out at Corn Queen's Park there. But certainly the time is, we've got to get the momentum up because other jurisdictions are racing ahead. You know, mm -hmm. California's doing remarkable things. Do you want to give us a sneak peek about what's going to be in your report in November? Well, I've got a, a series of reports coming up, of course, because I've got my big annual report, uh, which you report on a, a number of initiatives. So, uh, there's... Uh, it, there, are, there weren't big, any big legislation passed in this minority government, so there's not a big review of very much legislation, and, there's, and so it uh, gives me some latitude to, to go into some some other issues okay, that need so some where attention. Are you going? And well, then, then after that, I've got a I've got a greenhouse gas report that's coming out, and the, and the government has not released their greenhouse gas report on which mine is based, so they're going to get uh, a frank uh, discussion. Because I no longer have to say, well, here's their report and critique that. I I basically have a blank sheet to take it where I want because I'm required to report by law and they haven't given me anything to deal with. Okay, but you very skillfully just blew me off in terms of the annual November report about sure. with the latitude that you have since there was no legislation, you can investigate where you will. Sure. So what areas are you looking at? Well, we, you know you, you know, I can't report uh, the details because, no. uh, because I'm required to report the legislation. Can part. you give us a hint about what you're looking at? Well, I think, uh, I think one of the, yes, there's, there'll be a surprise coming pretty soon and it won't be November. Um, in, in terms of, uh, I think one of the things I'm required to do by law is to report to the legislature on compliance with the Environmental Bill of Rights. And, and uh, that's something that gets a little more light this year. And that's how well the ministries have uh, respected the rights of Ontarians with respect to the Environmental Bill of Rights. Okay, last thing. Almost every policy we hear coming out of Queen's Park these days is filtered through the prism of this $15 billion deficit that the government mm -hmm. is trying to wrestle to the ground. To what extent do you think this deficit affects the government's willingness or ability to be greener? Well, it does. It's a strong effect, but it's totally unnecessary in the sense that you know I think it's a, it, it's a bit of a ruse from those factors within the government that uh, don't want to see uh, the government greener and uh, some of these environmental initiatives. I really strongly feel this. We you know we're about what a 135 billion dollar budget. That's 135 thousand million dollars, right? Just drop the million. Let's say it's 135 thousand. So. How much would you spend on the environment of, uh, or, or, or green energy initiatives, you know? Well, if, if you had a $135,000 budget, well, you might spend $10, $150 of $135,000. Well, if you did that, that sounds like a trivial amount of money. That's $150 million in reality. And we're not spending the kind of money that we could. The amount of, the, the deficit is important, don't get me wrong, but with, we're playing around with some very important things with a budget less than 1% of the budget. Uh, overall spending in the province of Ontario. So it's how important is it? I think it's, it's, uh, they, they are using the, the fear of the $15 billion deficit, which is real and significant, but to do a lot more, um, to withdraw from a lot more programs and do a lot more cutting in key areas than uh, would be appropriate if uh, people had a, a, a long look at it. That's Gordon Miller, Environmental Commissioner of Ontario. As always, we thank you for coming into TVO. Good to be here. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.